we came to Jackson in, I think, early March, uh, when this pandemic was really starting to pick up steam. At that point, I don't even know if Miami-Dade had a, a case, uh, a positive test, maybe a couple, but it was obviously much different than what we're, uh, than what we're finding here. So I think the... Um, Every day, and you are doing nothing. So I You're think. You're falsifying information, and you are misleading the public. Over 4,000 people have died, and you are blaming the protesters. You guys have no plan, and you're doing nothing. Shame on you. So it that was a protester yesterday slamming Florida's governor, Ron DeSantis. He was the guy at the podium. He's now facing an explosion of new virus cases after downplaying the risk for months and reopening his state ahead of meeting the CDC guidelines. It was in late April, after a very short statewide lockdown, when we saw Floridians flocking back to the beaches in pictures like these. But now the state is seeing the consequences of returning to normal life too early. Today, Florida set a single-day record for coronavirus deaths, with 132 lives lost. That climbing death toll coming off the heels of Florida's record-breaking number of daily cases on Saturday, more than 15,000 new infections. It was just two months ago when Governor DeSantis loudly boasted that his state wasn't New York, it was not Italy. So now there's this comparison to the virus's origin from an infectious disease specialist at the University of Miami Health System, no less. Quote, Miami is now the epicenter of the pandemic. What we were seeing in Wuhan six months ago, now we are seeing there. Joining us, former Florida Congressman and MSNBC political contributor David Jolly. Heilman is also still here. David Jolly, I know you love the state. It's heartbreaking to see what's happening there, in large part because of the hubris of Governor DeSantis. Yeah, that's the word, Nicole. It's heartbreaking. It's angering and it's heartbreaking. It's it's saddening. Look, our our political leaders got the initial decisions wrong. The governor DeSantis got the initial decisions wrong. Today's numbers prove that out. The president got the initial decisions wrong. And as voters, we get to make our political judgments of that. But the real danger in getting those decisions wrong, and, and I would say cavalierly getting those de those decisions wrong is they unleashed risky, dangerous behavior of a citizenry that, that then was validated by their political leaders. Go back to the beach, go back to the bars, go back to get your hair cut. It's no big deal. Everything's going to be fine. And, and the contrast in leadership that we could see right now is leaders issuing statewide mask wearing mandates, uh, revisiting whether or not schools can actually come together. To, to steal a line from Andy Slavitt in a conversation earlier today, if the American people each wore masks for the next four or five weeks, we could virtually eliminate the virus because we would eliminate transmission. Florida is the opposite behavior of that, and it's because our leaders have, have validated it. I'd also say, rather than take the approach of Trump and DeSantis that we just open schools and put these demands on schools, what about leadership that invests in distance learning and teleworking, spend money on tax credits for businesses to say every employee is going to be provided an infrastructure of telework. We could transform the economy of the United States through different leadership, not this bullheaded, short-minded leadership that unleashes a rebellious public uh, in, in contrast to their own public health interest. John Hallman, I have tried to tie a string from rushed reopenings, surging infections, and a Democratic leader, and I can't find one. So, so tell me what this is. Was this a desire to please? Was this a shared sort of ideology of not believing in science? What do you think it was that made the governors of Florida and Texas and Arizona sacrifice the health of their citizens to rush to reopen? Um, I think it was a combination of things, to call. I mean, it started, I think, with, uh, with just the pure chance of geography, which is that, as you will recall, everyone vividly recalls when this thing started, it, was, it really was a blue state phenomenon, and particularly it was a New York City phenomenon above and beyond any place else. And you saw mm -hmm. outbreaks in Detroit and California, Washington State. And so many of these red states were largely unaffected by the virus in those early weeks and months. And I think they became... Uh, seduced, uh, d deluded with the prospect that they might somehow mm. evade the, the kind of inexorable logic of the virus. That's one thing. I think the second, obviously, is fealty to Trump. They, and when, 
when it looked like New York had taken the, had, had gotten over its over the peak that Governor Cuomo talked about. You had the you had the president start to say, "Well, we got to open up. Let's open up. Let's open up." You then had a bunch of slavishly loyal Republican governors to Trump who did essentially what he told them to do. And there's no doubt, I think, underneath all of that, the third thing that you mentioned, and I'm, I'm just feeding your own lines back to you in some sense, but there is, of course, <laughs> as there is in Trump, and as there unfortunately has become. Kind of pervasively in the Republican Party, and a skepticism about empiricism, a skepticism about science, if not outright hostility towards those two things. And the combination of all of those things, the, the sequencing of it, the loyalty to Trump, the delusion that, that all of that bred in combination with uh, a, a party that has come to be so antithetical to the scientific method, I think, created uh, something that we all looked at and said, you know, this is a ticking time bomb here. And now it's obviously exploding in a way that's incredibly damaging, uh, not just obviously for the citizens of those states, but I think for the long term prospects of Republicanism in a lot of the Southwest and the Sun Belt, where the party has been so strong for so long. And David knows uh, exactly how that's happened. It looks to me increasingly like they have a long term, potentially decades long generational problem that this is going to leave a, a deep, deep, deep scar on the Republican support across a lot of these big states in the Southwest. You know, David Jolly, um, to John's point, Congressman Deutsch was talking about this lack of leadership on a state and local level, that it it's maybe starts with loyalty to Trump and a denial of the science and data. Um, but it, it comes down to individual decisions being made in real time. Carrie Sanders also yeah. reported today that a mask wearing mandate had failed in a um, city and county in Florida. So how do you how do you write the ship? How do you turn the policy making at a local level yeah. just for, for, to do nothing else but to start saving people's lives? Yeah, Nicole, I'm, I'm going to take some license and just be very blunt, because I agree with John's assessment. We're often generous sometimes in how we analyze and provide analysis, but let's just call it what it is. It's stupid. No Our one political leaders are me behaving. of that. <laughs> no, it, look, it, the decisions have been stupid. We have stupid people leading us through a pandemic. We can say it's because they have a conflict of interest or they're worried about the economy or they want to get reelected or they're ignoring science. They're stupid. They're fundamentally stupid people and they are leading us down the wrong road. And the calling of leadership in this moment is to convince the American people that it is in our interest to shut this entire thing down, to come up with alternatives to education and to the workplace environment, lead us through the public health yeah. pandemic, get us on the other side stronger than we've ever been, both with our public health and with our economy. They have made the wrong decisions. And, and at times, you got to, we, we, I, have to stop parsing the decisions they've made and said they made stupid decisions mm. and we need to call them out for it. I think you make a, an important point and a blunt point. I appreciate both. The, the important point being we have to dispense with some of the niceties to get to, to move the conversation to what the future looks like because literally, our lives would appear to depend on it. David Jolly, thank you. John Heilman, I did not miss the little cameo there. Which dog was that? It's Tissa. Hey, Tissa, come here. Tissa, come here. Come here. Come here. Oh, come say hello. Okay. Come here. Come here. Come over here and say hello. Come on, get that. I needed get that. that. There it is. There he is. Oh. He always wants to be on with you. Oh, my God. Oh. Here comes the other one. He's here comes the other one. So hey, Fife, come here. <laughs> come here, Fifey. Come here. There's Fifey. A double here, canine. Cameo. Look at this. Look at this. It's like two winning of them. the lottery. This is my life right here. This is my life right here. Look uh, at you this. You got a These good life. Beasts. You got a. You got a they good life, my they friend. They both miss you desperately. They miss you desperately. Let's get hello. them a they, show. They say, Where's Nicole? <laughs> I know. We'll, we'll get you a home off, studio, and, and then you can have Next an hour, and they can have an hour. I can't wait. I can't wait. Something to look forward to there. All right. After the break, more proof.